Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to our virtual webinar this afternoon. My name is Gina Holmes. I'm the Community School Coordinator at Lincoln Elementary School, and I'm joined by other coordinators this afternoon. Cesar Kartova is from Marvine, Kim Bush from Northeast, and Greer Hagemeyer from William Penn. Uh, North Penn Legal Services is here with us today to talk about housing and renters' rights. Um, and I am going to introduce Sarah Andrew, who is going to be taking us through the information this afternoon. Thanks for being here, Sarah. Thank you. Yes, my name is Sarah Andrew. I'm an attorney at North Penn Legal Services. Um, North Penn Legal Services is a uh, civil legal aid organization. Um, this is our, our mission statement. We strive to solve civil legal problems and empower vulnerable populations through professional legal representation advocacy and education and what we're going to do today is talk about tenants rights um, especially during this time of the coronavirus um, so i do have a, a powerpoint up and a general overview of who we are at north penn we're civil legal assistance advocates we don't do criminal uh, legal assistance but if it's a civil matter um, we serve people who live in Lehigh and Northampton counties. Our office is right on Main Street, 555, 559 Main Street in Bethlehem. And we serve people who qualify for our services because they are at or within the federal poverty guidelines. So we serve lower income people with civil legal um, matters. And to apply for legal services, we have a centralized intake line um, you can call Monday through Thursday, 1-877-953-4200. Um, to go through our intake, see if you qualify, and get assigned to an attorney. Um, we do more than work on housing issues, so I'm going to go through what other things we can help people with. We do handle some family law matters, contested custodies, PFAs. Uh, things of that nature. We don't do divorces right now, but we can point you in the right direction if that's what you need. We help people with public benefits, um, mostly assisting people with appeals if they've applied for various public benefits and been denied. Um, we help people with employment issues, especially eliminating barriers to employment. So, so we work on unemployment compensation, uh, reclaiming unpaid wages, and we also do criminal records, expungements, and pardons. We do consumer law, which um, might include bankruptcy or representing people in debt collection matters. And then finally, we do um, work on mortgage foreclosures, preventing foreclosures in whatever way we can. And we work with tenants on rental housing situations, including housing discrimination, which we'll talk about a, a little bit later. Um, the way to apply for our services, again, call that centralized phone number. Here are our hours. And then we also take online intake applications at www.northpenlegal.org. And that's a 24 seven uh, availability. You can go online, fill out an application and someone will get back to you. What we're going to talk about today is basically tenants' rights. Um, we're going to do a walkthrough of the eviction process and the various things to consider if you, you're being faced with an eviction, such as what rules does the landlord need to follow and what should you do if your landlord tells you that you have to get out, how long the process takes, what might happen to your belongings if you get evicted, some special things you might consider if someone in the house is sick or disabled. We're gonna focus a little bit on how to get your landlord to make repairs that are needed. And we're gonna talk a little bit about resources for affordable housing. So starting with a basic primer of housing law. The, the law that you would go to is the Landlord Tenant Act of 1951. This is the law that um, controls everything having to do with evictions. It puts forth the landlord's and the tenant's obligations and includes everything about a rental, including lease term, security deposit, and notice to terminate the lease. In general, the thing to keep in mind is that the landlord-tenant relationship is based on an agreement, a contract. That contract is the lease. 
Um, it's better if you have a written lease, even if you don't have a written lease, as long as you are paying someone in exchange to stay at, at a property and you're doing that in a regular way, there is a lease that's an oral lease that is um, just by nature of you having an agreement that you're both living up to. So it doesn't have to be in writing. It's better if it is in writing. The Landlord Tenant Act does not apply to rooming houses or hotels. Um, there, there are exceptions to that if the hotel is an extended stay type of situation where you receive your mail, you have your own kitchen facilities, um, you know, and you stay there for a long term. Um, but so th there might be a question as to whether it applies in those circumstances, but for all other types of of uh, residential rentals, the Landlord Tenant Act applies. What that means is that a landlord cannot lock out a tenant in any way without using the Landlord Tenant Act to pursue their rights under the law. So a landlord can't just tell someone, get out, you have two days. A landlord cannot lock your door or change your locks on you without a court order. They can't make the unit unlivable by cutting off utilities or something like that. The only way a landlord can legally evict tenants is by going to court and filing a, a landlord tenant action and getting a court order that says that the tenants are evicted. So we'll, we'll talk about the, the steps of that process in a minute. The important thing to keep in mind is that once you get that hearing notice, if you have an eviction hearing, if you lose at that hearing, you still have a minimum of 21 days until you would have to be out of the property. So it's not like you go to a hearing and you lose and you have to go get your stuff out that day. You have a minimum of 21 days, even if you do lose the eviction hearing before you have to be out. So sometimes people get what's called a notice to quit from their landlord. Um, this should be the starting process for an eviction. Um, the notice to quit is just a letter from your landlord that says you have this many days to be out, you know, for this or that reason. And if you're not out by then, I'm going to file a landlord tenant case against you. This should be the starting point for most evictions. And this doesn't get filed with the court. It does not have to be notarized. It can be a pretty informal thing. It should be in writing. You can waive your notice to quit if you have a written lease and there's a provision in the lease that says, I waive my right to a notice to quit. Um, if you do that, then, you know, there are arguments that we could make that you didn't know exactly what you were signing or that it wasn't obvious enough. But what happens then is that your landlord still has to file a case in court against you, but they just don't have to give you a notice that they're going to do that before they do it. You will get notice of the court case. You just might not get uh, a notice beforehand. I see that there's some questions, I think, in the chat. So, or maybe that's just, you know what's in the chat? I'll tell you what's in the chat. There is a, um, a, a PDF, if, you, if you're with us, a PDF of the uh, PowerPoint. So um, you can contact any of the school coordinators and, and get that. Um, so that's what I wanted to say about the notice to quit. If you have a subsidy, such as Section 8, or you have some sort of HUD-related subsidy, or you live in public housing, then the notice to quit cannot be waived. You always have the right to that notice to quit letter. Um, okay, so landlord gives a notice to quit. You don't leave by the deadline. Next step is landlord files a complaint, usually at a magistrate. The hearing is then scheduled for seven to 10 days later. The tenant is going to get notice of that hearing. It's usually gonna be a letter in the mail. You must go to that hearing. If you get notice of a hearing and you don't show up, you will basically automatically lose and the, the landlord will get a judgment against you. So I always recommend definitely go to the hearing. 
If you need advice before the hearing, call North Penn Legal, visit our website, there's a lot of information there. If you are also experiencing issues like bad conditions at the property, um, leaks, plumbing problems, um, pests, you can file a cross complaint and that will be heard by the magistrate at the eviction hearing. So you can file your complaints against the landlord at the same time and have it all be heard at the same time. Definitely go to the hearing and then whatever happens at the hearing, the judge has up to three days to um, issue a final decision. There are two, there's basically two possible types of judgments that might be issued by the judge at a landlord tenant hearing. One is straight up possession granted. Um, there's no um, basically opportunity except for an appeal for the, the tenant to get out of this. The tenant has to move out by the eviction date. Um, they don't have an opportunity to say pay uh, unpaid rent and get out of it. The way that you can deal with a possession granted order is to file an appeal. If you don't file an appeal, then the, the, the order stands. You have 10 days after the judgment is issued to file an appeal. The appeal gets filed um, it, with the court of common pleas of your county. And so you, it goes from the magistrate up to the county court level. The thing about appealing is that you have to keep paying rent while the matter is being appealed. It's not called rent anymore, it's called a supersedious payment. And basically what that means is you pay your rent to the court while your appeal is pending. And in exchange, you get to stay in the property. Now, if you're lower income, you can pay one third of the amount of your monthly rent at the time you file the appeal. And then you have 20 days to pay the other two thirds to the court. So you don't get the opportunity to appeal and just not pay. Um, but there's, you know, there's always different circumstances. So if you have questions about this, you can call North Penn Legal. Um, if you get the other type of judgment, which is called a pay and stay or um, possession granted if money judgment not, not satisfied. What this means is that the judge has found that you owe the landlord rent. And if you pay that rent, plus the court filing fees before the constable comes, you know, 21 days later, then you will have satisfied the judgment and the eviction will not go forward. So if you get a pay and stay order, you have an opportunity to pay and make the eviction go away. If you can't pay and you need time, then you're still gonna have to appeal to, to get that time. Um, and if you do appeal, then generally you, you sort of lose the opportunity to pay and stay. But for the most part, if you're gonna pay the landlord, it's possible to reach a settlement at that point. So those are the types of, of judgments that you might get. We talked a little bit about appeal rights. Main takeaway is that you are entitled to a court hearing. Your landlord cannot put you out without a judgment from the court. And you do have the right to appeal that decision and maybe get yourself a little bit of time to move. If you do lose an eviction hearing, like I said, you have a minimum of 21 days to get out whether you appeal or not. Your personal belongings, even if on, the, on that 21st day the constable comes, the constable does not arrest you unless you, know, you refuse to leave or, or cause a scene. Um, however, the constable will change the locks and make it so that you can't gain access to the property anymore. There is no time of year when evictions can't happen. And evictions can happen to people with disabilities and people of any age and people with newborn babies and people who are in wheelchairs. Um, there are no, not exceptions there. Um, evictions are, are, if it's a legal eviction, then the constable can change the locks on you no matter who you are or what your circumstances are. Um, if you didn't have time to get your things out of the property, what we recommend is that you write to your landlord. This can be a text 
we recommend a, a letter, um, keep a copy for yourself, to tell the landlord you have not abandoned your things and that you need some time to come and get them and try to set up a, a time when the landlord can meet you there, let you in to get your things so that you can move out. If you tell your landlord um, that you have not abandoned your things, they must safeguard your things for at least 30 days. And they have to give you a 10 day notice before they discard your belongings. So if you, um, set, you say you get that 10 day notice or you, you know, initiate telling your landlord you want to get your stuff so don't throw it out, the landlord can move it out of the property and store it in like a storage facility for up to 30 days. You're going to have to pay for that storage fee though. Um, but after 30 days, if you didn't get your stuff, your landlord can, can discard it. So you do have some time to get your stuff. If your landlord throws your, your stuff out, you do have some legal options for how to deal with that. You can sue your landlord for damages. Um, you can come to us and we might be able to file an injunction at the court to stop what is happening and get your stuff back. Um, but your constable, the constable does not put your stuff out on the street and they don't arrest you. All they do is, is lock you out of the property. Um, so that was a general overview of the eviction process. And what I'm going to talk about now is some special rules that have to do with the coronavirus. Um, now over the summer, um, there was a moratorium on evictions, which means that evictions couldn't happen based on the governor issuing a, an emergency order. That moratorium has ended. It doesn't exist anymore. There was another um, type of moratorium under the CARES Act that um, allowed certain people, cer certain people had a moratorium if they had subsidized housing through HUD. That moratorium is also mostly over, but some notice provisions still exist under that, under that uh, law. The one thing that we really have to rely on right now for tenants facing eviction is the CDC order banning evictions. Now that came out on, uh, I think, September 4th, and it was an order from the Center for Disease Control. It's a nationwide order. Um, I have some links here on this, um, on this page. If you go to this website, this COVID-19 eviction forms, it will walk you through the declaration that tenants have to do, which I'm gonna talk about in a second. Or you can go to this link, which will take you to the North Penn Legal Services website about this issue. Um, so, main things about the CDC order. It does not necessarily apply to everyone. It definitely applies to tenants who are facing eviction because they can't pay their rent. That is primarily who this order protects. Um, in order to get the protections of the order, you have to file a declaration, or I should say, sign a declaration and give it to your landlord. You don't have to file it with the federal government, but if there is a court case going on, you should also provide a copy to the court. Now the declaration um, is basically a, a one page form and you have to go through a couple statements and, and verify that they apply to you. And the basic, um, basic things you have to agree to are that you have used your best efforts to obtain all available government assistance for rent or back rent. You expect to earn no more than $99,000 in annual income for 2020 or $198,000 if a joint tax return. So that's going to apply to a lot of people. You're unable to pay your full rent or make a full housing payment due to loss of household income. You're using your best efforts to make timely payment of rent to the extent possible. If you were evicted, you would likely become homeless or need to move into a shelter or, or shared housing circumstances. And you understand you still must pay rent or that you are responsible for rental payments. And that this declaration is only good until December 31st, 
and after that evictions can resume even if all of this applies to you. So those are the main points. If all of that applies to you, you can find, print out this de declaration, sign it. It's a sworn statement. Um, you could be subject to perjury uh, penalties if you make any untrue statement on this form. But if you can sign it, sign it, give it to your landlord, and then the CDC order um, should be sort of activated for you. Um, so every adult on the lease is supposed to sign this and give it to the landlord. And there are two videos online from LASP, Legal Aid of Southeastern Pennsylvania, one in English and one in Spanish. I have links at the bottom of this page that you can watch to get a little bit more information about this process. You can also call North Penn Legal and we can talk you through it. Um, the order does not protect people if the eviction is because of engaging in criminal activity, threatening the health and safety of other residents, damaging or posing an immediate threat of, of damage, violating applicable building codes or health ordinances, or violating contractual obligations. These are five um, exceptions in the order. If these are the reasons for the eviction, then you cannot get the protection from eviction through the CDC moratorium. But in theory, if you're being evicted for any other reason, this should apply to you. This is a new um, situation for the courts. Um, there's a lot of conversation about how to address different circumstances. If you have any questions about whether this applies to you, please contact an attorney either through the Bar Association or, or, or contact us and we can talk you through it. So that's kind of the state of evictions right now. I want to move on to um, what if you need repairs. I wanted to see if anyone on the on the call has any questions right now that I didn't answer about evictions that you think I should answer. And seeing none, okay, we'll leave it at that. Um, one of the other issues that tenants face, you know, relatively frequently is that you're living in a place, you're paying a lot of rent, you want the place to be clean and safe and habitable. Um, that is a very reasonable thing to want. And sometimes people have a place that's not in good repair or has problems and they need to know how to fix those problems. So what we're talking about here, the legal theory is the warranty of habitability. And this is a warranty that is implied by law in every residential lease in Pennsylvania. What that means is that um, cases over time have established this as a right that tenants have to a safe and habitable property. The landlord has an obligation to provide sanitary conditions and that includes things like working heat and smoke detectors, no infestations, um, all systems work properly. Um, that is the landlord's obligation under the lease. A landlord can't get around those things by saying, well, it was like that when you moved in, so you should have known better. Um, you always have the right to request that the place be made habitable. There is generally gonna be a municipal codes department, no matter where you live, and you can always call codes to um, have them come out and inspect for whether the property is up to code standards for habitability. Now, the one thing is that that might backfire on you if the place is really bad and codes finds it not inhabitable, they might make you move and, and condemn the property. So you kind of have to weigh that the risk of calling codes, but if, you know, if it's a, a circumstance where it's not like terribly um, dangerous, they might just come and say, no, this is something that can be repaired, issue a citation to the landlord, and then the landlord has to answer to codes or face fines or other types of prosecution. Generally, in the Lehigh Valley, tenants don't have a right based on municipal codes to, to sue the landlord um, and get any financial compensation. People, people's 
uh, ask that a lot. You don't have what's called a private right of action under the codes where um, failing a, a code requirement per se, like definitely uh, is a violation of habitability. So, you know, it's sort of like you have to see whether it, um, it that's going to work for you. But what if you want repairs to be made? Um, what is the way to go about that? So there is a way. Um, the thing not to do is to straight up just stop paying rent. A lot of people sort of feel like I shouldn't have to live like this. I'm not paying my rent until this is fixed. Well, that's not the best way to handle the situation, although I understand why people might feel that way. So our recommendation is if you have a request for a repair, you need to put that in writing. Ask for the repair and give a deadline for the date that you need that repair to be done. Our website has a, a landlord tenant handbook and a couple sample letters that you can look at and model your letter after. But basically you want to say, you know, here's the date of the letter, dear landlord, these are the problems, you have until such and such date to fix them, you know, please get in touch with me. If the landlord does not make the repairs based on that first letter, then you have a couple options. One of them is repair the, the, the problem yourself and deduct the amount of that repair from your rent. This is a good um, thing to consider if you do not want to move and the fix is something that can be fixed, like say a, a leaking pipe or something like that, um, and the fix costs less than your rent. If the fix costs more than your monthly rent, this is not going to be an option for you. But if you need a pipe to be replaced that's leaking and the landlord won't do it, and you call a plumber to come in and it costs some fraction of your rent, then you write another letter to your landlord that says, you haven't fixed this, I'm gonna hire someone to come and do it and I'm gonna deduct that amount from my rent unless you fix it you know, within two days. So again, put it in writing before you do it. That's to protect you in case your landlord tries to file a, an eviction case after this, okay? So that's one option. Another option, withholding rent, again, not the best option. Uh, the court does not generally like to see that. But if the repairs are extreme and you they're more than what the rent is worth, then you could consider simply not paying, saying, landlord, you've breached the lease by having an uninhabitable property. Save your money, move somewhere else. Um, the 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 problem with this is that you're really um, setting yourself up for losing an eviction action because the judge will say, well, if it was so uninhabitable, why did you stay there? Um, and, and basically, you know, landlords want to be paid if you're staying in their property. So not the best option. Sometimes it's the only option. The other option is to move. Um, so tell the landlord, I gave you till now to fix it. You didn't fix it. You broke the lease. We're leaving. And by the way, we are not paying rent anymore and we want our security deposit back. Now that's an okay option when there are places to move to. Right now, that's not so easy. Um, but I will say, if you do take that option and you want your security deposit back, there's a way to do it. You need to give your forwarding address and say that you want the um, security deposit forwarded to you and surrender possession, meaning hand the keys over and say, we're done, we've left. Um, there's things you can do to try to collect on a security deposit. If you have questions about that, again, you can look on our website. Um, I also wanted to talk a little bit, that's sort of the the you know uh, real basics of how to get repairs done to the extent that you can at your property. I uh, wanted to take some time to address certain fair housing issues um, related to housing discrimination and protections um, that might be there for families in the school district. So I'm, I'm talking about these things from that perspective. So we're going to focus specifically on um, protections for families and people with disabilities. Um, 
And the, the purpose of going over this information is that it does set up some other defenses to evictions so that you can avoid being evicted from your home during this time. So when I talk about fair housing protections, I'm talking in general about the Fair Housing Act, which is a federal law. There's also fair housing protections in Pennsylvania under the Pennsylvania Human Relations Act. And each of the cities in the Lehigh Valley has its own municipal uh, human relations ordinance. Um, one sec. Okay, so what are these? These are laws and ordinances that protect certain individuals in protected classes from discrimination in housing transactions. And that's all housing transactions, um, buying a house, financing a house, renting, um, advertising for, for rental properties, anything that has to do with housing, um, insurance, renter's insurance, homeowner's insurance, these laws apply. They apply to people in protected classes who live in dwellings. And dwellings in this case has a, a specific meaning, and that is a structure designed or occupied as a residence or land offered for, for sale to build residences on. There are some exemptions. Generally, um, a homeless shelter that is not a, a permanent housing situation where you leave your stuff there and that's your mailing address, it might not apply there. It might not apply to an owner-occupied building. So if there's a building that has four units in it and the owner lives in one of the units, the Federal Fair Housing Act does not apply. Um, Pennsylvania has a similar restriction. But aside from those exemptions, generally these laws are going to apply to most likely your housing situation. So the protected classes in the Federal Fair Housing Act, which was passed more than 50 years ago, are race, color, national origin or ethnicity, and religion. Those were the originals. Sex was added in 1974, and that includes sex discrimination and sexual harassment. And then in 1988, familial status and disability were added as protected classes. And familial status in this case means families with minor children or people who are securing custody or adopting or expecting a child, a child to be born to them. So those are, we're actually going to focus on familial status and disability. But if any of these apply and you feel you have been discriminated against on the basis of belonging to a protected class, then you can report that and file a complaint to be investigated. So if the event happened within the past year, or say if, if the act of discrimination um, was within the past one year, then you can make a complaint directly to HUD. You can do that by calling this housing hotline number. That's 800-669-9777 or visiting the website. The link is right here. You can make a complaint right over the phone or fill out a little form. Basically, they want to know who are you, where did this happen, what protected class are you in, what was the discrimination, who did it to you, um, and how did it impact your, um, your housing situation. You can also file a complaint with the Pennsylvania Human Relations Commission. They have a six-month statute of limitations, so if it happened within six months, you can call them directly at 855-866-5718 or visit their website. There is a link right here to file a complaint. North Penn Legal Services also has a fair housing hotline, 610-317-5322, and we can give you some guidance about how you might want to proceed. Some examples of discrimination based on family status, um, because it might not be obvious what this means to people. But if, if someone refuses to rent a place to you because you have children, that's discrimination. Requiring children to live in a certain area of a complex, charging rent per child, instead of uh, like basically making it be one bedroom per child, 
um, or telling a family they can't have a second floor apartment because the children would be too loud. These are all examples of discrimination based on family status. The general rule for how many people can be in a unit is two heartbeats per bedroom. So it is not up to the housing provider to say, okay, you have this many people in your family, your family's too big. If technically, you know, it's, it's, you have enough people in your family that it doesn't take up any more space than two people per bedroom, then that place you can decide for yourself if it's appropriate for you. The landlord can't do that for you. Um, so these are some examples of discrimination based on family status. If this happens to you, you can file a complaint with HUD or the Pennsylvania Human Relations Commission and get an investigation. Just last year, there was a case at a complex in Allentown where a, a woman with a child was, was told she could not live in that complex. An investigation happened and that complex had to pay $60,000, um, both in fines and as retribution to that woman um, for, for doing that. So these claims are taken seriously, they are investigated. They might not be investigated fast enough to help you with your problem, but sometimes, you know, telling someone, hey, you're discriminating, I'm going to file a complaint, might change their mind about how they deal with you. So that's why it's important to know your options. Now, the other class I'm going to focus on is the rights of tenants with disabilities. This is a special class um, that has some special extra rights under fair housing principles. So first we're gonna define who is a person with a disability for these purposes. And that's gonna be an individual who has a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities. And that's going to be things like thinking, hearing, talking, breathing, seeing, general things that you need to navigate your world. If you have a disability that limits, you know, what you can do, then you might qualify, you know, as, as a protected person. Um, the other factors are if the individual is regarded as having such an impairment. So if, if the landlord says, it seems like you've got this problem, um, so we're going to, you know, discriminate against you. If they're regarded as having a disability, then it counts, or if you have a record of such a disability, then it counts. Um, individuals with disabilities, as I said, have some special rights. They can make requests for changes if those changes are needed to allow them the same full use and enjoyment of the property as, as a non-disabled person would have. The change that you're requesting has to be directly related to the disability. And these are the two types of, of general categories of changes that can be requested. You can ask for a reasonable accommodation, which is the change or exception to a rule, practice, policy um, that the, that the uh, housing provider has. Or you can ask for a reasonable modification which is a physical structural change to the property. So modification would be like a ramp or a grab bar um, or a peephole to see out your door if you um, are, are hearing impaired, things like that. Something that directly addresses and fixes you know, the, the disabling condition for you. Um, generally, what we are gonna be working with is reasonable accommodations for people. That is changes to, um, uh, rule or policy. Um, generally, the change to a rule or policy um, has to be allowed by the housing provider if it's not prohibitively expensive and if it doesn't fundamentally change their, their practices. Um, so those are sort of the two times when a housing provider can say, no, you're, I'm denying your accommodation request. Um, aside from that, they should approve the request for a reasonable accommodation. So how a reasonable accommodation might help you. Here's a scenario. There's a member of the family who has uh, mental health issues. 
that results in um, outbursts or, or disturbances in the community and you know with neighbors and the landlord says you have to leave we can't handle these outbursts anymore it's too loud well if the reaction is based on a mental health or emotional disability then the request for the reasonable accommodation would be wait don't kick us out give us time to address this give us time to get the person into treatment let us you know see a healthcare provider get some counseling adjust meds change change the behavior that's because of the disability and do not proceed with this eviction on that basis now as long as you can get a letter from a, a, a care provider, it doesn't have to be a doctor, it can be a social worker, it can be a, a, a counselor that says, this is a person with a disability. Um, their disability means that they you know, behave in this way, they um, are seeking counseling to address it. It does not have to have the diagnosis the housing provider is not entitled to medical records. That letter from some sort of, of healthcare provider is sufficient to establish that a reasonable accommodation is appropriate and it should be granted. So that's one example. Um, another example is say there's someone in the house who um, has a physical disability where they need a first floor or otherwise accessible apartment and for whatever reason the landlord says okay your time's up we're evicting you then you might make a request for a reasonable accommodation for more time to find an appropriate place to move to so that the person with the physical disability um, can move to a place that accommodates their disability so these are some examples of ways that people with disabilities have a little bit of extra protection. Generally, it's going to be asking for more time to deal with the situation or possibly ending the eviction if it's in some way related to the disability. A tenant with a disability can ask for a reasonable accommodation at any time in an eviction process, all the way up through the appeals process. There's no deadline. Um, by which you have to make this request. But if you want a reasonable accommodation, you do have to ask for it. It does not have to be on a special form. It's best if it's in writing and it's best if it says, I am making this request for a reasonable accommodation, but there are no magic words. Um, and again, North Penn Legal does help people with fair housing issues so if you call that fair housing hotline or even our general intake line um, and say you have a housing discrimination issue, someone should get back to you to talk to you about your options. Um, so those are the only two things I'm going to highlight about housing discrimination. I just have some information on this slide about affordable housing resources, basically. The, the one website we send people to is this uh, pahousingsearch.com that lists various um, affordable uh, rental availability based on your zip code or your area. I think a lot of the places on, on this website are basically full. If it's a, um, a complex that, that provides housing to people who are lower income, there's likely to be a waiting list. So um, my recommendation would be still to check it out and see what waiting lists you can get on because waiting lists are, you know, a barrier. You have to wait your turn, but your turn will come eventually. It might not help you in the moment, but if you feel you, you qualify for the, this type of housing, then I do recommend take the time, call around, get applications, get on the waiting list because um, you're never going to get in there if you don't do that. So you, you, you won't get in if you don't do it. Do it and see what happens in the future. I also have the phone numbers for the various housing authorities in the Lehigh Valley, Allentown, Bethlehem and Easton, and also Lehigh County and Northampton County. Those are the housing authorities locally. 
if you call them, they're probably going to tell you either there's a waiting list or the waiting list is closed for Section 8 or public housing. Um, but they do open up one, once in a while and they can give you some more information to follow up on. I know people are having a hard time finding housing right now. I have seen people maybe have a little bit more luck either trying to work with a realtor or looking on um, Facebook Marketplace or things like that. I would caution you, you know, it's, it's fine to, to go through all your options. Just don't give money to anyone without seeing a place, signing a lease. Um, you want to make sure that it is a legitimate offer, that there is a place that's being offered, and that it is, you know, habitable. Um, again, you have those warranty of habitability protections, but if you can avoid moving into a place that has obvious, glaring, terrible problems, then that's, that's obviously better. So try not to um, just make sure it's a legitimate offer. And that's basically all I have on affordable housing resources. Again, we, we um, provide legal uh, assistance and education. Our, this is best we can do for you here is just give you some other places to follow up with. And then this is the, the last slide. And basically the conclusion here is that um, North Penn Legal is here for you. You can call us and see if you qualify for our services. Even if you don't qualify for our services, our website is there available to everyone. Our landlord tenant handbook is, is on the website in English and in Spanish and has a lot of information in it that can help you. So I'll see if anyone who's participating has any questions that I can answer, but if not, um, feel free to call or visit us and I hope this was helpful today. I had a question um, about appliances. Say you move into an apartment that has a fridge and an oven and the oven breaks, where does the burden of repair fall for families? Um, good question. That is really going to depend what it says in the lease. So the lease Again, we recommend getting a written lease that would clear this up, but generally a lease is gonna say, this is what the landlord provides, this is what the tenant provides, and it will list those major appliances. So if it says that the landlord will provide it, then the tenant should be able to say, hey, it's broken, landlord, the lease says you're providing it, it's broken, fix it. And that's you know one of those situations where you might have to be a little bit more aggressive um, about getting it done, but these are essential things that people need. You need a stove, you need a fridge, laundry is ideal. Um, but if it says in the lease that it's, that the landlord doesn't supply it, um, then, you know, the tenant might have to provide their own. And I think if that's the situation, just, it still makes sense to let the landlord know, I, the fridge is broken, I'm getting my own fridge, the fridge is mine. I'm taking it with me when I leave. Um, so yeah, it's going to be the lease is the place to look at for that. Any other questions? Um, I, I will say I didn't talk about utility shutoffs. I just sort of didn't have time to fit it in. But there is uh, an organization called PULP, the Pennsylvania Utility Law Project, that if you visit their website, they have a lot of information about, um, you know, utility shutoffs, water, heat, things like that. Um, there is never uh, a time when um, all evictions are, are banned, you know, except for coronavirus protections. But there generally is a, a, a moratorium on heating shutoffs during the winter. Um, and generally, utilities have repayment plans. Um, so it's worth following up if that's, if that's one of your issues. There we go. And, and uh, someone just put the link in the, in the chat box there. We can provide that. So if there are no more questions, are there? I think that's about it, but we just wanted to thank you, Sarah, for taking the time today to share all this information with us.